Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter for another live Friday live stream watercolor. And um, I am flying solo today. I do have some wonderful moderators hanging out in the chat. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and pop them in there. And I would love it if you could just hop in the chat and let me know if you can see my picture and hear me. That would be a super help since I, I can't have the other one playing while I'm talking or I'll be all confused and uh, more confused than normal anyway. Um, I want to let you know about our sponsors today. Jerry's Artorama is where you can find all of the products that I'm using as well as some wonderful deals in their holiday sale that it goes through the end of the month. They have a lot of try it um, try it deals right now. I've had two orders come in already, which is really kind of kind of funny because um, cause a lot of the supplies I get from them are because I'm doing videos and they provide them, but I'm still over there shopping every time they have a sale because I just can't, I can't resist. The prices are so good. And I also want to let you know that I am taking part in Lifebook 2017 and I have a 20% off coupon code for you in the video description. That is a year long mixed media class that, um, has weekly classes for a year. And at the end of the year, you have this full art journal of mixed media paintings, which uh, is so special and something you'll always cherish. Plus you'll learn a lot along the way. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can find out more in the video description. So we're going to start by sketching and I just did a color study here. The colors we're using are phthalo blue or any sort of green base blue. You could use um, cyan or Prussian blue. Um, we're using magenta. You can use uh, quidaquidone red. You could use alizarin crimson. You could use um, permanent rose. Any sort of purple based pink, like a cool pink. We're going to use sap green. Um, the sap green I'm using is actually from Merami Blue watercolors, but you can use any brand you want. The other three are from M. Graham. And I'm using Gamboge, which is a warm yellow. So you could use uh, Cad Yellow Deep. You could use uh, Indian Yellow. Any sort of warm yellow that you have is going to be just fine for this. We're going to sketch with a pencil, and um, I'm going to sketch a little darker than I want you to sketch just so you can see it. And I'm going to start um, with a flower, kind of like a blossom. I'm going to, like an apple blossom kind of, or a cherry blossom. I'm going to start, and this is kind of different because we're putting this in the middle of our paper because our B is going to be also the focus, and that's going to be a little off to the side. If we were doing the rule of thirds, we'd have everything kind of divided in three this way, in this way, and then on those, those cross sections are where you'd want your focal point, and that's where our B is going to be on that cross section over here. So that's why I'm putting the smack dab in the center. I haven't lost my marbles. So I'm doing a really light circle, but I'm going to draw the petals a little bit darker. So a dot in the center to signify the middle of the flower, and I am going to do a uh, big petal there. In a pretty big petal next door, just going to the edge of my circle. I'm gonna do another one over here, a little bit skinnier. Do one over here. Oh, and this reference photo is also linked. And then I've got this one that's kind of tucking underneath. So I've got that other one just snuck right in there. You'll want a soft eraser in case you do make a mistake because this is going to erase without damaging your paper. And this is actually, this is from the dollar store because um, when I see those, I always grab them. Um, they're cheap really anywhere you get them, but the dollar store is the cheapest. By the way, I will um, be looking at the comments as we go through. I won't probably be able to get everybody's question. I'm going to do my best, but please don't yell at me or any of the moderators if I miss a question because it's me, not them, and I'm not perfect. So now I want to add like an under overturned petal here. So I'm just kind of pulling a little line in there. So that's what this petal is going to look like. This one has a turn on it as well. So I'm just putting that turned area. Uh, this one has like a little dent on it, but it's not turned. It's just kind of got a little dent. Um, this you can see just kind of like a little bit of an edge of the petal. Again, I'm drawing darker than I want you to. And this, we've got a little, a little hood on the top of this petal, right like that. And then if you want, you can put some little um, ends of the stamens here and draw them in. You could put a couple short ones over here because they're foreshortened, so you wouldn't see the length of all of those. Now for the B, the B is going to go over here. If anyone doesn't understand the rule of thirds, I'm just going to grab some rulers so I can show you really quick. Okay, so the rule of thirds basically means you divide your, um, your picture in thirds horizontally, and then you would divide them again in thirds 
vertically. And the places where they intersect, like where these rulers are crossing, those would be the places you want to put your focal point. Because when you do that, it helps your eye travel all the way around the picture. So that's what I mean when I say rule of thirds. I'm probably over explaining it, but I know some people are new or maybe they've heard that term before, but they're too shy to ask about it. So I'm going to get this B here. I've got the circle just to kind of give myself a place. I'm going to start with kind of an ovally almond shape for the back. Then we're going to do this other little uh, kind of almond shape coming off for the stinger. Then we are going to put the uh, kind of shouldery abdomen quad. Well, what would that would be? be like the shoulder leap quadrant of a B. And then we get the head up here. And I love how it's got a little movement. And then we're going to put our wings kind of coming off the uh, the back here, the top portion of the back. And I'm going to put a little, little nose on there so he can go in and get there to get his nectar. Got to give him, he's going to be able to get his nectar after all. Okay, so now I am going to get this little branch in here, get another little bud. We're not going to, we don't need to draw too much. I just wanted to get some, um, some things kind of planned out here. Not everything's going to be in focus. So this is a shallow de depth of field uh, picture. So our flowers in focus, our bees in focus, and anything that's on that plane is going to be in focus, but everything else is going to be very fuzzy. So we'll have this little butt over here in focus because it's on the same visual plane um, and spatial plane, actually. Uh, so the way people take photos like this is, um, and I say this like I'm a good photographer, which I am not, and that's why you know I don't use my own photographs very often, um, is is by um, shortening the depth of field. So it's it's telling that you tell the camera that you only want things in focus in this short this um this specific range away from the camera, and uh, usually like your portrait mode on your camera will do that if you just want like a quick fix and you want to try experimenting with that. Um, or if you have like a fully manual camera, you can adjust your it's uh, your depth of field, your your f-stop is what it's called. Um, I really can't go into it too much because I'm not a very experienced photographer. But um, if you do want to play around with that when you're taking your reference photos, it's a great idea. But uh, you can see exactly what I mean. If you click the reference photo link in the video description, you can see that beautiful photograph that I used. And um, I would show I, I can't show you that one because it's not a graphic stock one. It's one from Paint My Photo. So the uh, um, I'm allowed to use it, but I'm not allowed to show the actual photograph. Okay, so I'm using my M. Graham palette. Um, you can see how it's really big. You're not going to be able to see the whole palette while I'm painting. So I'm going to do my mixing right along this edge. So hopefully everything, um, if it's if it's important for you to see it, is where you can see it. I'm going to take a big soft brush and wet my paper. And I have just tacked down the corners because I want to have a raw, kind of like I did on my sketch here, I wanted to have a raw edge of... Um, of pigment and I will be um, drying my paper pretty soon after we get our color in there for our for our background so if you have questions at that point I will be taking some questions because while my uh, hair dryers going I'll be able to answer questions and uh, so if you if you got some burning topic then I will try to get to it then <laughs> So I want to get in, so we're going to do a lot of mixing, but first we're going to go in with some colors on their own. I've got my gamboge, such a warm, sunny color. I'm going to add this up in this corner. And I'm going to try to avoid putting too much on the, um, on the flower itself, but I didn't want to like keep the flower dry because I didn't want to have hard edges. A lot of times when you do add a yellow wash towards the top, um, it does signify light and sunshine, and it just gives it a very um, cheerful look. Now we want to do some phthalo blue. And any cool blue, remember, go ahead and use what you have. I paint by look more than, you know, looking at pigment numbers and stuff. I, I think you can get a really good, you can train your eye to really see what you're using. A little bit in here around the B. Try to also not paint like blue on top of the B just because you might end up with some green when you go in to paint that later. 
I do want a very soft look here. So I am anytime I see a like a hard line or I see colors not blending, I'm going over them to kind of spread them out a little bit. I don't want hard lines. And this is uh, one of the Mimic Klinskis from Jerry's. I think I forgot to link my brushes in the video description. So uh, that's what that is. <laughs> I hate it when I forget that. Um, I am going to mix some violet. I'm going to use my magenta and my phthalo blue. If I just have a little magenta in there, I get kind of like an indigo color that's really pretty. Actually, I think that's what I want, that more of an indigo color. And this will be a little bit lighter when it dries, so keep that in mind. Now I'm going to grab a little sap green. My favorite green. Add some of that up here. Such a fresh color. I love it. And I'm going to pick up a little bit of that gamboge, which really just warms it up so nice. Such a beautiful mix. I'm going to actually pick up some of that mixed indigo purpley color and add that to the green because that's really going to er make it earthier. I keep peeking out over at the chat. I see you guys are on the ball. The moderators are on the ball answering questions. That's what I love to see. I'm adding some of that over here. Now I think I want to mix up some brown. My favorite brown with this combination that I have going is the magenta and the sap green. They'll give you a beautiful brown. Try not to add too much water in it while you're mixing because um, because you'll really dilute it. You want to uh, try to get that rich chocolatey brown first and then add water if you need to. So that makes a nice rich brown there. Tap some of that in. Watch for puddles. Um, I'm still using that water that was puddling up on the edge. I'm just dragging it in. But if you do have some puddles sitting there, you could end up with some trouble down the road. And now I'm going to flick on some of my colors that I've left over so that I can get uh, some texture. And I think I'll flick in some pink, some of the magenta, because that would look like flowers kind of just like out of focus in the background. Yeah, Grace, splatter so early. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm just... I'm, uh, I'm living out loud today. What can I say? <laughs> but that's going to soften out and give us some nice, um, some nice, beautiful, soft colors. So get ready with your questions, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this brush. I'm going to soak up any little puddles, and then I'm going to answer some questions. So, so, uh, so be ready. All right, so my background's good. I'm going to heat it and look for questions. All right, question. I have trouble when glazing over an area I already painted on, the color always lifts. I make sure it's dry. Can I do anything other than using different colors? I have Cotman's. Um, the Cotman's are a student grade paint, and unfortunately, that is kind of a quality of student grade paints. Because of the fillers and extenders they put in them, they tend to um, not soak into the paper as much, and so when you glaze over, they lift. Uh, something you could do is work on a paper that has less sizing, so it will kind of soak in the color a little bit more. So if you're using um, like a Strathmore 300, which is a pretty heavily sized paper, if you switch to like an Arches or Fabriano um, Artistico, the, your color will, will kind of grab the paper a little bit better, and then you can glaze. Something else you could try is using your more uh, transparent staining colors like alizarin crimson, phthalo blue. Those colors are going to seep in and stain the paper a little bit better, and it will be a little easier to glaze over them, glaze over with them. If you're really frustrated and you have colors that you often like to use for glazing, go ahead and maybe try a couple pans or tubes of just those colors and see if, you know, and just replace a color here and there and see if that helps your um, attempts a little bit more. All right, this Gamboge looks slightly more green bias. Is it the camera or a brand thing? Asked Joey. Um, well, it doesn't look very green here. Maybe, I, you know what? On my palette, though, I haven't, I mixed it in with a little sap green, and maybe that's what you see there. Uh, this is a very golden yellow. Let me um, pull my palette over so you can see. Ah! The Gamboge is that one right on the, is, 
uh, that one right there, that's Gamboge. You can see it's much more orange than my to my CAD lemon and my CAD yellow medium. A question, what's your advice for my very first watercolor class I am teaching at my home? Um, I would say do something that you feel confident teaching because you your, your students need to feel that you know uh, what you're doing and that you're confident about it. Um, okay, another question. Are you going to do any more tutorials with Brusho or Colorburst? Oh my gosh, I totally forgot about those. I should. I'm not going to promise anything, but I, I definitely should do that. Okay, I know I missed probably half the questions. I do appreciate your patience. Um, we're going to go on and start um, painting. And we're going to go to a smaller brush. I'm going to use a number 12 round. Anywhere in the 8 to 12 family is fine. Whatever you feel comfortable. I recommend you use the biggest brush that you feel comfortable with. This one comes to a nice point, so, um, so I know this is going to be fine. I'm going to start off with my sap green. I just want to put it over where you can see it. I'm putting it right on top of that gamboge there. I do like the way the sap green and the gamboge look together, so I'm going to mix those. And I and this is pretty juicy, so I'll be able to charge other colors into it. I am going to um, just kind of put some little stems in here, little leaves, really loosely. And then my brush is starting to run out of the paint, but I'm going to use that to my advantage and kind of paint these ghosty little, little branch leaves. Branch leaves, just kind of get that little texture in there without it being too too dominant. Go in here, put some leaves in there on this branch. And now I can charge in some color. So I'm going to take the sap green with a little phthalo blue. I don't know if you can't see that, but I'll just, it's just uh, that's the thing that I don't like about this. This is why I don't typically use this palette when I'm um, doing a tutorial because I can't have it on screen because it's just so big. But it is my favorite palette. It's a Jones palette. I know someone's probably asked that already. Um, and I think it's around $20. But actually, I like the Pike palette a little bit better, but it was way more expensive when I bought this one. But I think they're about the same price now because it's, uh, the Pike palette is a more durable plastic that will, you know, take a lot more wear and tear and if you travel with it it will hold up to that now I'm going to skip over to some magenta and I am going to just kind of do a light wash on this flower got my Christmas shopping done well I got a lot of my Christmas shopping done yesterday I'll have to actually write everything down and uh, wrap things and see what sort of shape I'm actually in. Hopefully you guys are good with any holiday plans that you're making. Oh, by the way, this is a cold press paper. I'm just tapping it to give it a little texture and also keep it really, really light. I do know I want little bits of darker areas, so I am. I just wiped my brush off. I'm actually going to wash it and wipe it just in case I got into any green. And I'm going to grab some magenta and I'm just tapping it on my palette tap 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 just to kind of work it into the bristles to make sure I don't have any clumps and I'm going to put some of that here and there in the flower just to kind of give it a little dimension so I have some light areas and some dark areas you can use the whole side of the brush you can press it and use the side you can use um, just the tip of it if you want it's completely up to you and if you want any more texture just just pounce on it with a paper towel and if you want to smooth it more you can go into some water it lifts up pretty well for a for such a bright color like if you want to smooth it all right i'm going to do this little bud over here while i'm at it Charging a little bit darker color there. I like it when two colors kind of blend together like the green and red are. I think they're kind of, looks kind of cool. And now I want to do some really washy flowers that are kind of like out of focus. So I'm just going to kind of, just kind of dab my brush down with this pink. It's not really going to affect much, but it is just going to, 
give the illusion of maybe some bigger flowers on a branch off in the distance. And then I'm going to do some buds. Again, out of focus, little buds on this branch, kind of coming up to this branch here. And then they can get a little sharper as they come forward. Go in my green, rinse your brush, grab some green. And throw that branch right in there. And I'm going to kind of tap some of the color off my brush. And I do want a little bit of a kind of a focus branch over here, but I'm just being very suggestive with my strokes and not really um, being too definite. I just want to get this kind of like texture, like there, you can tell there's a branch far away, but you don't really see any details. I do feel like I want a little bit more on this branch here, kind of going up just because I feel like I've got, I've got, I've got leaves or buds and then I've got nothing. So I do feel like I need to add a little something to these ones closer to my main flower. And put a little bit of pink, at, uh, a little bit of green at the bottom of those two buds, and then add some pink at the top, and just let them smudge together. And they almost will resist each other when you do it like this, rather than mixing to make that brown. They'll they'll kind of push up, push against each other, and still retain their color. I feel like that needs a little bud on it because it's just kind of hanging on its own there. And a little green at the bottom. All right, let's work on our B. I'm going in with the gamboge. And look at how opaque that yellow is. You can see it on the top of my brush. I'm going to kind of, I think I'm just going to go right in and paint everything but the wings with this color. I like these M. Graham paints a lot. They're made in the United States, and they're very uh, vibrant. I don't know if they're, they used to be a really great deal. I'm not sure if they're still as affordable as I as when I bought them, but they certainly last a long time. Now I'm going to mix some gray. Um, so basically to do that, I end up mixing a lot of the colors around my palette already. I'm going to start with the, um, let me see what I have for a room right there. I'm going to start with my phthalo blue. And add some magenta. And I'll just drag in some of that brown there, a little more blue. Basically, just need to balance out that color until I get a nice gray. More red. That's a good exercise. There we go. We're starting to get gray there. Maybe a little bit more red just because it's a little too green. So if you see it's two of one color, you just go to the opposite. And I'm just going to put in the uh, wing. The wings. And then I'm going to grab a little water on my brush because that's way too dark. And I'm going to soften it. And I'm going to blot it because I still have too much on there. There we go. Just want that transparent wing. And we'll have to let that dry before we do any of the dark details on there. Okay, so now I think we'll go back to our flower. When I'm trying to decide whether a, a flower where something is dry or wet, I just put the back of my hand down. If the paper doesn't feel cool, then I'm good to go. Now I think that for this painting, when we're going to do some detail, you should have a brush that is not too juicy. And this is the um, Princeton cat's tongue number six it's from the 4050 ct line which is a synthetic line of watercolor brushes they're very nice they're great for beginners because they don't hold too much water um, but they're also really good when you just want to go in and adjust and not have a lot of um uh not grab too much water because sometimes you just have too much water and then you can't control how light and dark things are i need to make a little bit of a of a gray but i don't want a muddy gray so i just want to stick to my magenta in my phthalo blue. So I'm actually making more of like a purple. I could do a little bit of uh, a little bit of 
sap green in there. It's just that gamboge is opaque, and when you get an opaque color, well, it's more opaque. When you get an opaque color, it tends to make mud. That's why that color chrome oxide green is really difficult to work with. It just wants to make wants to make mud. All right, I'm really happy with this. Oh my gosh, I'm right. You can't even see what I'm mixing. For heaven's sake, that's what I've got right there. It's just kind of like a purpley gray. Uh, magenta, sap green, thalo blue is what I used. And um, this brush is fairly loaded, so I'm going to blot some of it off. I don't want too much. And I am going to go under um, like the ridges, under any overlapping kind of hoods on these flowers. And I'm going to put this color in and blot. I dip my brush in water and then drag out that shadow a little bit. And you can see I'm almost getting too much water with this brush. You can see kind of what predicament I would get in to if I had my like mimic brush there. So we're going to go in, we're going to add the shadow like underneath where the petals flop over, blot our brush, and just spread it out with some water. So this teaches you water control. And even if you don't love this painting, um, that's fine. You don't have to love it, but if you try it, I think you're going to learn a few things. And I can see that this petal's on top of that one. So not only am I going under the hood of that petal, I am also going next to the other petal because that would cast a little bit of a shadow. Rinse my brush, blot it a little bit because I don't want too much water, and then just drag that pigment. Very subtle here because we don't want mud. Picking up some more of that gray, going into this little indent area. This one doesn't really have so much of a hood as it just has like an indent. Bring that in there, and then again, rinse our brush, blot it, and use that water that's left on our bristles to spread that. Now, somebody mentioned glazing earlier. Um, I can glaze over this with magenta and keep all those shadows intact and just add that film of color, which I think we'll probably do in a little bit. So I think it's a really, um, it's it's just a subtle way to build up a painting. And this one has quite a bit of shadow on it, so I'm pulling that right down. Now, you might think, well, Lindsay, if you know gamboge is kind of opaque and it can mix to make mud if you're not careful, why on earth would you have it in your palette and why would you use it? Well, we're going to be doing our stamens in a little bit, and we're going to be painting them on top, and we want them to show, right? So by using that color, it's going to pop against this uh, the subtle colors we have underneath because that pigment's going to sit. Those big pigment particles are going to sit on the paper, and we're going to be able to see it. So there is a method to my madness, believe it or not. Now I want to go over here. Um, we also have that situation where we have some shadows on that. And I actually want to mix a little magenta into my shadow color. So that's all I'm doing. Um, so I've got the magenta. And I've got uh, mostly that gray that we just mixed. I'm just putting in a little bit of that on that bud. And I think that's probably all we would see for detail there. I want to mix up a little bit more brown. And remember, we did that with our uh, magenta. And our sap green, so I want to have some more of that handy. Now, yes, you could totally add, you could you could use burnt sienna or burnt umber with this painting if you wanted to, go for it. I just think that, that this makes such a nice brown, and it's easy, and I know um, a lot of people say they have a hard time mixing brown, so I thought I would just mix it and we could do it that way. But if you're more comfortable, if you want to do it the other way, you go right ahead. That's completely up to you. Now, there's a cool uh, branch in this picture, and it's just, it comes in and out of focus, um, and I like that, and I'm going to put that in. If you don't like it, you don't have to do it, but I got a little issue here where I have this long, spiky thing dividing my paper into, and I don't like that, so this is going to be a device that helps me um, break up this uh, this painting and not, because like I feel like my eye is just stopping in the middle of the paper, and so I need to do something about that, so this branch is going to help me do that. So I'm using this as a device. And I might put a few little buds on it, even though they're not in the picture, because I just want it to have a little bit more substance. And I think I'll just soften out a few of those, because that's where it kind of goes out of focus again. So it's just kind of, it's just really interesting looking in the picture. And something else is kind of interesting in the picture um, that I want to try to capture. I'm going to take some phthalo blue. If I put that out there, you can see that. And I'm going to pick up some of that gray that is mixed because that's way too intense on its own. And I think I want to just kind of put some more branchy shapes really loosely at the bottom of my picture. 
I need to balance. I've kind of, I should have shifted the butt over here a little bit more and had the B over here a little bit more probably. But, um, but when you realize in the middle of the painting that you, you know, you can't really make that change unless you want to start over. So you learn how to balance things out and how to uh, correct for those sort of situations. And plus it gives you a little bit of interesting texture, which I think is fun. And I'm going to go with, in with a little magenta and just kind of add some, uh, add some flower blobs. The only detailed flower is this one in the middle. Anything else is just going to be a flower blob. And there, it's it's kind of shifting our eyes through the picture a little bit more, and I'm, I'm more happy with that. Question, how many different brands of watercolor paint does Lindsay have? <laughs> oh, gosh. Is this, is, can, do, can we start a support group? Um, I want to buy a set, but I have no idea where to start uh, that works with a relatively tight budget. Um, I do have a lot of brands of watercolor paint, and I've two more since my little Jerry's order came in. Um, I have a lot of reviews on my channel, so I would recommend, if you have the time, to check out some reviews. Also check out reviews on owingsart.com or Owings Art on YouTube. He's got wonderful watercolor reviews. Um, most of the time we agree. We don't always agree, but um, but you can trust his opinion and advice. Also, uh, parkerblogs.com, P-A-R-K-A blogs.com has a lot of wonderful reviews. He's a very, I, I totally trust him. And Mandy, Oh, I'm going to say her name wrong. Gosh, she's, she's got a lot of reviews, too. Somebody knows in the chat, pop it in there. Her name is Vandy. I'm sorry, Mandy Von Gronberg, maybe? She's um she's Dutch, and she has a lot of really good reviews on watercolors. Uh, go between and mine, and go, go between the four of us, and I think you'd get a really well-balanced opinion on what watercolors to get. Um, there's a lot of really good ones. It's... it's in, in for all budgets, like the Turner uh, ones that I usually use are very affordable. That set of 18 is like $24, and it's going to last you a long time. Mine lasted me over a year painting with them a couple times a week, and I still have some left. Some colors I've used up, but for the most part, um, I still have a lot of those colors left. All right, balancing out colors here. I might have to put a little something in here because I feel like this is growing out of the top of that flower. It's kind of bugging me, but for right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. Now I am gonna glaze, so I'm gonna blast that for a second with a heat tool just to make sure that color is locked down real good. I'll peek in for questions while I'm doing it. All right. Oh, everybody's helping everybody in the comments. I love that. Oh yes, Van Gogh and Lucas Studio are fantastic paints to start off with. Um, I like the Lucas Studio is almost as good as the Lucas Professional brand. They just don't have as many colors in their line. Oh, and yes, uh, good uh, good comment, Christy. It definitely depends on where you live for how much um, how much the paint costs and what brand is best because huge price differences between countries. Question: How do I tell if my watercolor paper is cotton or not? It doesn't seem to be on the cover. Um, if it doesn't say, then it's probably a wood wood, wood pulp paper. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means you're you're uh, it's going to be a little more slippery to paint on a lot of times, and the paint paper might not take as much of a, abuse. It might not take as much uh, like layers. Like if you did a bunch of glazing, it might um, kind of pill up on you. So you know, just go easy on it. Um, or test it on a scrap, see how many layers you can put before it starts to rebel on you. But um, but if it doesn't say it's generally a wood pulp paper, I'm going to do a glaze. So what I've done here, actually, you know what? I'm going to teach you something. I'm going to teach you a controlled wash. This is a super uh, useful technique to have. You want a round brush for this. Uh, something fairly juicy. You know what? I'll use this one. If, if, this is, if this feels too cumbersome, go with something smaller. You want to feel like you can control it. You want to make a puddle of paint the color you want on your on your paper, I mean on your palette rather. And then what you're gonna do, and you're gonna need to be able to tip your board or you tip your paper. And so what you're gonna do is you are going to make a bead of color. Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna kind of paint a little area here, but you are going to pick up paint and fill that with as much paint as you can. So can you see that I have like a really juicy bead there? Almost wants to run down my paper. Okay, then you're gonna make another stroke right underneath it. Okay, this is going to give me a beautiful, perfect, um, even wash of color. So as long as I just have that 
one wet edge, I shouldn't end up with any hard lines. So now I'm running out, so I'm going in, I'm putting some more color in there from my puddle, because that's what, and you need to mix enough color to begin with this to work. And you're just, you just keep going in horizontal strokes, dragging the color back and forth. Okay, see how we're getting such an even veil of color? This is probably where I use the graded wash, the uh, controlled wash technique more than anything else, is just get a beautiful, even um, layer of color somewhere. You only need to be careful around the edges to make sure you're keeping your contours. And you need to be able to tip your board. That's the important thing. Or tip your watercolor pad, whatever you're using. Now, when you get to the end, you're going to have a puddle. See, I got a little puddle there. If I didn't do anything to that, it's going to backwash and give me a ruffle or a bloom. So I dry my brush off on a paper towel, and I just set that in there. And that thirsty brush, that dry brush, is going to drink up any extra paper. And look how easy that was and how we got such a uniform glaze of color there. So that's a really great practice uh, thing to practice. You can just draw a bunch of boxes or a bunch of shapes like hearts or flowers or whatever on some uh, watercolor paper and you can practice that over and over again. It's a really wonderful technique to try. All right, I am going to, I'm gonna hit that with a dryer real quick. And then I'm gonna show you how to mix up some nice black. All right. Okay, so we're gonna switch to a smaller brush. Um, and actually, you know what, I'm going to mix with a synthetic brush. I don't like to mix color. If you want to get a real dark color, you're better off mixing with a synthetic brush than like a, a brush that's meant to mimic animal hair because it's not going to hold as much water. And if you're mixing a dark color, you, you want less water. So I'm going to start with my darkest color because I'm going for black, right? So I'm going to start with my phthalo blue. And I'm just going to mix it right on top of this, this color here. It's not really going to affect anything. So I got my phthalo blue there. I think that uh, I've had this paint sitting for a while. I think the uh, the honey that's in the paint separated a little bit because I had a very sticky patch there. And I am going to add in some magenta, and I've, I've scraped off as much of the color off of my brush as I can. So now I'm getting a nice purple. But instead of going to the yellow, because I know the yellow is going to be opaque and going to make it kind of brown, I'm going to go to sap green. I'm going to rinse my brush off so I don't transfer any color into that into my sap green. So I'm grabbing my sap green, mixing that on there. So I look at this now and I say, boy, that looks pretty red. I think that looks pretty green. So I know I need it to opposite. So I'm going to scrape off my brush. I'm going to go into the red, the magenta, rather the same, I'm, I'm using the same colors. And there we're getting a nice neutral there. And it is getting a little brown. So when it gets a little brown, what I like to do is then go into blue because brown, it's almost kind of like an orangey color, orangey brown and it's opposite is going to be blue. So there, now we're getting that nice inky black. So it's when you're mixing browns or blacks, it's it's a when you're mixing browns especially, it's a case of balancing your color. When you're mixing black, it's not only balancing your color, but it's keeping out mud. So you need to keep the opacity out when you're trying to mix black. Now I like this one. I need to get some control. This is the Mimic Kalinsky. Um, it's a fake Kalinsky, but it's got a little more snap and stiffness than the squirrels, and um, you'll have a little more control. But it will hold quite a bit of paint. So I'm loading that up in my, my uh, homemade black paint, and I'm going to go in and add my details. So I'm just going to get the little stinger here. I'm going to get um, the stripes on the back, and I'm actually going to paint the stripes in little, um, little strokes because I want it to kind of have a little bit of a, uh, of a texture to it. Now I'm a very. This brush is fairly soft, not as soft as the squirrel, but pretty soft. Um, and I'm going over an opaque color. Opaque colors are not the best to glaze on top because they'll want to lift up. So that we're just kind of laying that color on top, and we're not going to fuss with it too much, or we're going to mix into the yellow, and we're going to end up with mud. So it's just these little things that you kind of learn along the way. I also want to give us a little bit of a, a definition along the edge, and I'm going to mix in. I'm going to wet my brush. I'm going to pick up some of this brown that's next door that we mixed up earlier. That was the magenta and the sap green. And I'm going to give it a little shadow. Give them a little shadow under the uh, that back onto the uh, stinger area. 
Also shadow under the wing a little bit. And I'm going to do a little bit of that on the uh, top of the shoulder area, what you call it on a, on a uh, bee, and a little bit on top of the head. Because there isn't a lot of detail in my photographs, so i got to kind of fudge it a little bit. I'm just giving a little bit of shadow on the bottom there. I need to define the wings a little bit, so I'm going to go back in with that uh, black, but I'm going to add some water to it so it's more of a gray because I don't want it to look like a cartoon. Just give a little bit of definition there. And it's okay if the wings are a little fuzzy because if they're moving, they would be a little out of focus. And you can even drag a little bit of that out to make it a little out of focus if you want to. Okay, so now let's go back to our our flower. Well, that's a little wet. Let's work on some of these other flowers a bit. And maybe I feel like I need something else in here. I was mentioning it early, but I'm really earlier, but I'm really feeling it now. Um, so I'm going to go in with some sap green, and I am going to sketch on another little. Uh, kind of branch coming off over here because I just feel like uh, like that's just very distracting and I'm going to grab a little bit of that gamboge off my palette and add that right in there let it kind of mix Is anybody interested in me doing a uh, cheap supply haul? I kind of made out like a bandit at a, at the Dollar Tree <laughs> this week. And I know I'd already done my Christmas Dollar Tree haul, but boy, I, I did find some goodies. You can, uh, Bev Roberts, you can order something that's out of stock at Jerry's. Um, and, and you will get the sale price. They just, as long as, long as your out of stock stuff is over $35, um, They'll, they'll hold it for 90 days. If in 90 days it hasn't come back in and the order's under $35, they might cancel it or something because it might have been a special item. But, yes, you can order it out of stock and you'll get the sale price. And they don't charge you until they ship it, until they're ready to ship it. So um, it's very – it's I do it all the time. If I see a great price on something, I just jump on it. I think sometimes, if, especially if they're introducing a new line, they might not have a huge stock of it because it might be kind of risky um to stock that much of something that's new and again I'm, this stuff i'm doing here is just just balancing everything out um karen no the chat is not available after the video um i would just try to scroll through and read what you can i i can sometimes see like the last 20 minutes of chat after the um the video goes live unfortunately I wish we could keep the chat afterwards. That would be awesome. I feel like I want to do a little more spattering over here to kind of fill this area. And I want um, sloppy, juicy spatters. So I'm going to go with a big brush with lots of uh, that's really loose and long. And I'm going to go in with my sap green. Really, really juicy here. So the wetter your brush is and the you know more bristles you have, the bigger splats you're going to get. And you can blot them if you don't like what you get. Um, the smaller, stiffer brush, you're going to get more of like a spray, more of like snow. Like on the mailbox I did the other day, if anybody caught you might not have caught that because it was more of like a kind of a crafty thing. But um, you got a really fine spray because of the, uh, the toothbrush I used. So what I want, I want your eye to kind of go across like that, kind of spray across. So that's why I've kind of got the, the focal point of the bee going in that way. Okay, now I feel like maybe with this big juicy brush, I will dab in some more colors over here. And maybe dab in a little bit of green over here to kind of give our little bee a little shelter. So it's funny, we start with a reference photo, but by the time we're done, a lot of times we've completely uh, we've completely changed it. But that's what a reference photo is for. It's not for necessarily copying perfectly, which you totally can, um, but it's kind of a good starting off point or jumping off point. Oh, do we have, does, did somebody lose sound? 
Let me know in the comments, guys, if you're having a hard time hearing. Oh, I guess it's all right. Yeah, whenever you, if you're a loose sound or something goes crazy, you can always go and watch it on my blog or, um, or refresh your computer. Sometimes things go weird. Oh, good, good. People are saying it sounds good. Awesome. Oops, and I left my brush in the water. I've got to stop doing that. Wooden handle brushes, don't leave them in the water. And I've got two in the water. Good grief, I don't have Sarah here yelling at me to take my brushes out of the water. Okay, I'm going to dry this and look for comments. So if you have questions, go ahead and put them in. I'm going to be looking for them. Oh, no! Did I splat on the camera lens? Oh, did I? I'm putting my hand in front. I hope I didn't. I don't think I did because I don't see it on my hand. Oh, <laughs> Uh, Jen, yes, the brush giveaway contest is still going. You can sign up on the post on my website. I pick, I draw the names like a week after I post the um, the contest. Oh, thanks, Viv. Okay, one vote for the haul. That's good. Sandra says you sound like Lindsay to me. All right, my mic is working. Hello, Alex. I'm glad you made it too. Camera looks fine. Okay, someone froze a couple times, but just refresh if your thing freezes. Question, what was the tip about getting a masonite board from the hardware store? Um, yeah, I would have a couple cut for you that, that match the size that you like to paint. Um, a lot of times they'll cut them for free, and you can get like a two foot by four foot piece for a couple bucks, and they'll cut it to the size you want. Could you tell, uh, I have a question, could you tell paint consistency when you mix, i.e. pudding or skim milk? Sure, I'll mention usually like skim milk or whole milk when I'm doing uh, watercolors. Question, why did my Lucas paints separate when I mix them? I bet that may have more to do with the palette that you're using than the paints, but sometimes the pigments settle out. Lucas feels, ha like the pigments feel a little heavy, um, so that could be why, the minerals in them. Oh yes, and Dominic Designs mentions that I do have a place on my blog for a request, if you have a request for a video, because I'll never remember it, seeing it in chat. I've got to have it in my list. Okay. And yes, we have a Facebook page. We'd love to have everybody join the Facebook group if they want. Or it's not a, it's not a group, it's a page, but it's the same idea. I just I didn't think about doing a group when I started a page. I'm not that savvy on the uh, social medias. Okay, so now let's um, do another little layer of shadow on our flower and then do some um, do some of those stamens. So I'm using the magenta, just a little smidgen of the phthalo. I don't want a lot. I just want to make it a little bit cooler and darker. And I'm just going to do little kind of accents. Not a lot here. Subtle. Actually, the in the flower in the picture is really kind of like a white. I, a technique I like to do is just put the color down and then use a damp brush to just hit the edge and smooth it a little bit. I was just I was just thinking, oh, I don't want to jinx myself. Things are going pretty smooth today. <laughs> and then the internet goes away. The internet crashes. We'll do that to each of these petals wherever we want a little, a little more shadow. And I think I might do a little bit on the outside here. Okay, so now we're going to go in with our gamboge. Oh, a tip when you're when you're uh, going to start painting, especially if you're using student colors, but even no matter what colors you're using, is to spritz your palette with water a couple minutes before you begin, and your paints will be activated and ready to go. And I just honestly recycle bottle, any spray bottle. You, you don't have to have anything fancy. Just recycle a spray bottle, keep it full of water um, at your table, and it works great. And I'm just dabbing in the ends here. And I think I want to make the stems a little dark. So what I'm going to do is actually I got that gamboge on my brush. I'm just going to pick up a little bit more. And I'm putting on my palette in my brown section here. Generally, I would have my colors spread out quite a bit more when I'm mixing, but I want you to be able to see kind of what I'm doing. So I've got this kind of mud there. I know it's kind of green-based. I need to add a little red to it to make a nice brown. So that's what I'm doing, grabbing my magenta, which is the red I've been using. Because you don't want to go in and dip into something new at this point because it's not going to match or harmonize with what you already have. So now I'm grabbing, going to grab that color, and I am going to streak any of these little dots that I made with the yellow. I'm just going to streak 
a little stripe down towards the center. Try to be quite dainty with this. I'm using a number zero round Mimic Kalinske. They're a little bit stiffer than the squirrels, so they work for this pretty well. Um, you know, they don't they don't bend or flop. Sometimes when you're using like a liner or a rigger, it'll want to um, kind of bend on you and you'll get like a weird, which is great for tree branches and stuff because you want that kind of random look, but sometimes it doesn't look so great for um, for tiny controlled lines that you're trying to make. All right, now when I've got this dirty brush, I'm actually going to grab some magenta. And I just grabbed a little bit of the magenta with a phthalo in it. So I've got this really wine, deep wine color. And I feel like I want some more definition on that flower because it is a lot darker than my reference photo. And plus those pencil lines are kind of... I Because remember when I said don't draw it dark like I am because I wanted you to be able to see it? Well, this is another reason I don't like seeing those pencil lines the way they are. So I am going to add some accents cover over those pencil lines by putting in some sharper, um, crisper lines with this color. I don't know why. Sometimes it bugs me and sometimes it doesn't. I think it's like if I'm drawing something really loose and scribbly, the pencil lines don't bother me at all. But when I'm uh, trying to have something kind of delicate and dainty, then they bug me. Sometimes you can go in after the painting's dry and you can erase the pencil lines, but then other times they get kind of trapped under your paint and they don't want to let loose for anything. I'm also adding some of that down the pit of this flower just to give it a little shadow and make it feel like these stems are kind of coming out from the middle. And I think while I'm at it with that color, because I kind of like it, I'm going to add some crisp shadows and details in this uh, stem here. Anything I want to be in focus. This is kind of like a focusing and grounding color. It is going to help me bring certain elements that I want in focus nice and sharp. And maybe I'll let those two kind of fade off and I won't focus them because I want to, I don't want the eye stopping smack dab in the center. I want to kind of guide it out. So I think I'm going to use this as a tool for that. So I'm mixing up a little bit more of that because I'm almost out. And by using a small brush at this stage of the game, I'm not going to get too much. Um, I'm not going to get too much paint and go overboard like I otherwise might. I have a tendency to charge in with way too much paint and then um, regret it because then I have to go remove it or correct for something that I've done. I feel like I want another branch over there. So I added that kind of shadow with that wine color. I'm going to take some sap green and just kind of add a few little flowers because this could be coming forward into the... the um, into the plane, our three-dimensional plane that's in focus, so that could be in focus even though it's it's completely in another part of the picture. It could be on that visual plane or spatial plane. And now I feel like it needs a friend because it's just hanging out there by itself, so we're going to put another little flower there. Now, a lot of people think you can't do a painting like this with watercolor. You can't go in and decide you want to add elements because you're working with transparent color. And to an extent, they're right. But I think as long as your background wash is light enough, you can go in and you can continue to add more. Always experiment. Always try to see, try a technique to see if it works for you. Every painting's different. Every artist is different. So I'm going to go and put some more leaves over here around these two buds that I've put in. I'm going to add some gamboge to those because gamboge is opaque. Um, so it's going to sit on top. Of my paper it's going to hang out with those colors and it's going to make them look like i planned it that way like they were there on purpose because it can hold its own away, uh, over those transparent colors that are underneath okay now i'm looking at my picture on the monitor and kind of giving it a critical eye and i'm thinking that i want some pure magenta i'm going to use this brush again and i am going to just kind of give certain spots in these petals a little pop. And get your questions ready because I will do a little Q&A at the end here. So um, if you've been waiting to ask me something, then um, then be ready with it because I'm going to go right to the comments in a second and take any questions you have left. I'm going to do a couple little buds over here just to, again, balance out our picture. 
and also give a little bit of a visual frame and kind of give a little protection to our little bee there. And if your question goes up in chat and I don't see it, just, just pop it in again. You know, can copy it and paste it and pop it in again because uh, I know I'm giving you kind of an early warning there. And the mods will help too. Maybe a little splatter. Splatter on a little of that yellow, that gamboge too. Hold on it. I like that yellow. It really does because it's opaque. It does have a nice impact. All right, and there is that painting. My goodness, we're under an hour just barely. So I will take a few minutes to answer questions. Uh, and well, I'll scroll up a little. Hopefully, I won't mess anything up by scrolling up over here. Mm. Yep, just type the word. Oh, question: Will you do a video with your favorite paints, M. Graham? Please. Well, this is uh, this is these were with M. Graham. I did use one Marami blue color. My, my magenta was Marami blue, but um, I discussed at the beginning of the of the uh, the thing about how big my palette is, so it's tough for me to show you mixing if I'm using these paints. Uh, question, what's the best combo to make a light, light skin color? I like yellow ochre, burnt sienna, alizarin crimson, and ultramarine blue. Use those in different um, different amounts, and you will get a huge variety of skin colors. But obviously for a light skin color, it's going to be more of the magenta and the uh, yellow ochre, and just little t touches of blue to cool it down. Um, oh, the Mungio water salt. I ordered the, the pearlescent Mungio soft pastels. Somebody was asking about those, and I will be doing a review on those re uh, soon. I've never used them before. They look a lot like the portfolio, so I'm curious. Uh, okay, thank you, the robot and her dog. Um, question, with the Turner palette, what's the best good combo, combo for skin to comb? <laughs> talk the best combo for good skin tone color I would say yellow ochre um, you know you might want to use the Mayan red because that's a very weak color and it's easy to control uh, probably then a little smidgen of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna um, Christina asks what's the easiest color to blend any color that's an earth tone is going to be easier to blend because you can lift it up if you need to um, so that's what I would that's what I would suggest. With watercolor, you kind of, you wet your paper and you add the color, they're all going to blend pretty well. Staining colors will be a little tougher. Those are the darker ones. Um, any thoughts on Daniel Smith paints? They're fantastic. You can't go wrong. They're pricey. But um, I find the, the their sticks, their watercolor sticks are the same as what's in the paint tube and they're cheaper. And they do give you like the higher series colors for the uh, for all the same price. So uh, try those if you're on a budget. You're not going to be missing anything uh, with them. Uh, Bev Roberts, yeah, they, those Amungio pastels are on a crazy special right now. That's why I couldn't resist. I got the pastel ones because I have so many solid oil pastels. Um, oh, thank you, Laya, for the um, for the lovely comment there. Yes, Joey, anything with the Big Jones palette would be M. Graham. That's what I have. My, I have only M. Graham and a couple Marami blue colors in that palette. Uh, so we'll take a few more questions. If you have them, just go ahead and type them in the chat, and um, and I will get to them before we sign off here. <laughs> Thank you, Bev. <laughs> uh, she says, I don't know how you do it. Paint and talk over the questions at the same time. <laughs> um, okay, that girl, Tatiana H., asks, um, for some reason, I have trouble with schminka paints. They disappear on paper. Am I doing something wrong? Or is it the paper? I would say it's probably the paper. I do have some schminka paints, and they are fantastic. So uh, you need a paper with a little bit more sizing. I'm just going to scroll up. I know I just missed a question there. Um, Joy asks, what class do you have that teaches color theory? I have a couple um, color mixing videos. If you want to look, search split primary palette. On my channel and you'll find it um, so I have a, I have like two videos on color mixing on my channel for free just a search color mixing let's see I think I just missed somebody's question please bear with me guys I just scrolled up like halfway through the chat <laughs> 
Uh, shades, how do you, uh, question, how do you get different shades of pink without using red and white? You use water instead of white and stick with your cool reds and you'll get lots of pinks. So alizarin crimson, magenta, quinacridone, rose, any of those colors will give you, uh, will give you pinks. Uh, gosh, I know I missed a question. Um, question, are you going to do any more Christmas cards in watercolor soon? I'm not sure um, because we're getting real close to Christmas. Um, I do want to do a painting of Christmas candy and Christmas uh, ornaments, but I have not planned it yet. So I'm planning on it, and you could obviously do those smaller for cards if you wanted to. Um... Okay, I think I am, oh, I'm almost, I got another question here. Um, what watercolor paints do you not like and why? Um, any paints that I wouldn't like were probably ones that were really chalky. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Uh, there was, there's some, like, uh, a lot of, there's a lot of these opaque kits that I don't care for too much. There was a, Gr Grumbacher had a couple sets of their hard pan watercolors that I don't like. I, however, love the Grumbacher Academy watercolors, and I haven't used the Grumbacher fin Finest, but they have some pans that are really kind of chalky that I didn't like. Um question i bought turner gamboge's brown streaks in it it's probably the binder separating squeeze a little out and stir it up but they shouldn't if you just bought it and separating i'd probably just give them a call and they'll probably send you a new tube give jerry's a call um oh gosh i just went went, went by where can I get half or whole empty pans at a good price? Um, they're kind of hard to find. There's a place called Half Pan PH, which is a company out of the Philippines that ships worldwide. And there is, um, I've ordered them on Amazon via Jackson's Art Supplies in the UK. I don't know of any American sites that sell them at a reasonable price. And I think they've been out of stock at Jerry's for the past year or so. Um, try those two sources. <laughs> This is not a stupid question, but uh, Robot Hunter da Dog asks, how good do you have to be before you dare to start a YouTube channel? I think it's whenever you feel like you have something to share with other people. That's when you could start a YouTube channel. Um, question, have you tried any Skillshare classes? Any recommendations? I have not, actually. Um, I've only taken Craftsy classes. I have a class over on Craftsy. Uh, there's a link in the video description. It's actually on sale for $19.99 right now. But, no, I haven't done any yet Skillshare. Oh, I have taken some at Curious as well, but it really depends on the instructor because at Curious, they make their own classes. The instructors do where at Craftsy, Craftsy films them all. Um, is there, a, yes, there's a dot card option if you're wanting to try Daniel Smith watercolors. Um, you can buy a dot card for like five bucks. Um, question, will you do a more advanced watercolor tutorial? I do have some more advanced watercolor tutorials on my channel and I kind of alternate them. All right, I think I am at the end of the list. If I missed your question, I do apologize. Please uh, just post it in the comments below and I will answer it after the live stream. Please uh, give this video a thumbs up before you go. That really helps my channel. And if you're looking for art supplies, check out our sponsor, jerrysartorama.com. They have a fantastic holiday sale going on right now. Lots of things are discounted and they have a lot of try it where you can kind of try some of their products. Um, for the first time, you know, well, it doesn't matter if you've bought them before, before you can try them for like a dollar or two, a lot of panels, a lot of brushes, just so you can kind of get the feel for it to decide whether you want to invest more on in them. Uh, plus, they have a lot of paint sets on sale, things for gifts and whatnot. And if you're looking for a gift that we'll keep on giving all next year, check out Lifebook 2017. There's a link in the video description and a 20% off coupon code. You get weekly classes for a year, and it is just a wonderful experience. And I hope to see some of you guys joining me on that because I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you so much for uh, muddling through with me. And next week we should have Sarah back, so it'll be much better. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you to all the moderators that helped me get to your questions and everything. I do appreciate it as always. And thank you for your patience. Have a great weekend, everyone. And until next time, happy crafting.